Chapter one. Tanya, we learned Besef Perekimul de Nido in the third chapter of Gemara Nido. Mashbiyah Moshe, before a soul is born, they make him swear to heat tzaddik, be a righteous person, and if you can't be a righteous person, at least Al Tihi Rasha, don't be a wicked person. Vafilu Kalaylam Kula Emrim Lachat Tzaddik Oto. Even if the whole world tells you you're such a tzaddik, Heye Beinecha Ker Rasha, you have to view yourself like a Rasha. It's not good for you if you accept their opinion of yourself and say, look at this, I'm a Russia, I can finish working. There are some questions. We learned Aves Perek Beis in the second chapter of Pirkei Aves. Don't view yourself negatively. And if you will see yourself as a Russia, then what's going to happen? You'll get heartbroken. You can become depressed. And you won't be able to serve Hashem properly. You won't be able to serve Hashem, which requires simcha. You need simcha to serve Hashem. What's the other option? If your heart is not saddened by this, you could become a callous person if you don't care that you're a Russia, if it doesn't get you down. So if you're going to think you're a Russia, either it's going to get you down or it's going to make you callous. Acho Inyan, the explanation to that question. But then, before you were born, they made you swear that you would view yourself like a Russia. How do we answer that question? The answer is, as we find that there are, in fact, five kinds of people. The oath that they gave you in heaven was, be a tzaddik, don't be a Russia. There's actually more varieties than that. There's tzaddik v'toivlai. There's a tzaddik who has, a tzaddik who prospers. Tzaddik v'dalai, a tzaddik who suffers. Rasha v'toivle, a Rasha who, proper, who prospers. Rasha v'rale, it's a wicked man who suffers. U and the intermediate man. The Gemara explains these five groups of people. Tzadik v'toivle, the tzadik who prospers, is tzadik gomer, the consummate, in other words, the complete tzadik. Tzadik v'rale, the tzadik who suffers, is tzadik she'ene gomer is the incomplete tzaddik. That's why he's suffering, so that he could be perfected in this world, so that by the time he comes to his judgment day, he should be perfect. And then the same we could apply also to the wicked who prosper and the wicked who are not prospering. There's a Kabbalah book called Raya Mehemna. It's a part of the Zoya. And he says, shehora sheboy He adds a little flavor. He says, when, it's, when you say it, tzaddik veraloi, a tzaddik who has who suffers, you could translate it literally that it means a tzaddik who has evil in him, but the evil inside of him is completely subjugated and under his control. That's why it's called vera. The evil is loy. It's to him. Is he? He's got it. He's in. He's in control. Ubi gemara seif perek tes de brachas. In another place in the gemara, it says tzaddikim yitzer toiv sheftam that a tzaddik is judged by only one inclination. Rishayim yitzer hara sheftam. And the wicked, they are also judged by only one inclination. Obviously, the tzaddik by his good inclination and the wicked man by his evil inclination. Beinunim. What's a beinuni then? The beinuni is ze veze shayftan. The beinuni is judged by both inclinations. Omar Rabo. In the Gemara, we have a quote. Rabo said, you want an example of what's a beinuni? He told his students, ke goin no beinuni. I am a beinuni. Omar le Abaye, his student Abaye. We're talking about the greatest tzaddikim in the history of the Jewish people. Some of the greatest tzaddikim in the history of the Jewish people. His student Abaye says to him, you leave no life for any other creature. If, pious, if piety and connection to Hashem is the source of life, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Rabbo, the greatest tzaddik of the generation, is only a Benini, that means the rest of us are not even attached to the tree of life. <laughs> we have no... We have no connection to Hashem whatsoever if a rabbi is just a Benini. That's a confusing statement in general. Why is Rabbo saying that he's a Benini? Lahoven calls Zebayir We have to understand all this very, very well. The Gam Lahoven Masha Mar'iv. There's one other thing that we have to explain in order to get this picture complete. Iyev is quoted in the Gemara Baba Basra as saying, Rebbeinu Shalei, the master of the universe, Barasa Tzadikim, you created righteous people, Barasa Rishoyim, you created w- wicked people. That is against the Torah. Torah tells us, Hashem doesn't tell you if you're going to be righteous or wicked. Ha, huh? isn't it true? Tzadik Barasha Loika Amar. 
that it's not it's not predetermined for you if you're going to be righteous or wicked. Heaven doesn't decree. Everything else about your life is decreed. Who you're going to marry, where you're going to live, what you'll do for a living, how much money you'll earn. But whether you'll be righteous or wicked is left to you. That's your free choice. That's another thing we have to understand. It must be true. The Gemara shared it. But what does it mean? What is the truth of that statement? Most important of all, we have to understand the true nature of this level called intermediate, middleman, benoni. What is that? Certainly now we realize it cannot be a person who, as the Gemara described it, has half sinful behavior and half virtuous behavior. Because if it's half sinful behavior, Rabbi could not have confused himself for this intermediate level, Bainani, because he didn't sin ever. The Gemara relates a story that when it was time for him to pass away, they couldn't get him. He was sitting in a field, he was hiding from the soldiers, and while he was hiding from the soldiers, he was sitting in a field on a stone, and he was studying Torah. His mouth never stopped moving from saying words of Torah. So the angel of death couldn't catch him. So he had to make a whole storm and make a disruption. Rabbah never sinned. How could Rabbah say that, a, that he was a Benini if Beninis are half sinful behavior? It doesn't make sense. He could not have erred and said about himself that he was half sinful behavior. There's another reason. When, when can a person, there's another thing. When can a person, when is there ever a time that a person could actually be considered a Benini? the intermediate category. If a person will sin even once, he's called a complete and utter wicked person, sinful person. He has sinned against Hashem and he has not repented. If he did go and repent, well, now he's completely righteous because he has not sinned against Hashem. You want to say, well, maybe he did something not so important. There's no such thing as not so important. It says in the Gemara very clearly, in the Gemara Yevamis, in the Gemara Enida, even a person that violates a minor prohibition of the Chachamim, of that the rabbis instituted, is called completely wicked. Even, so you say, well, maybe you didn't sin, maybe you saw somebody else sin and you didn't do anything about it. It's also a certain level of wickedness, but maybe you're like an intermediary because you didn't sin, but the other guy sinned. No, even somebody says the Gemara, even a person who saw another sin and didn't stop him, that's called a wicked person. Why didn't you stop your friend from doing something terrible? That's talking about people who transgress prohibitions of the Torah, that they're called wicked. Certainly a person who had an opportunity to fulfill a mitzvah, to do something that God asks you to do and you didn't do it. Certainly. That's a Russia. Like any person who has the ability to toil in Torah, he has time, he has it on his schedule, and he doesn't do it. The Chachamim apply a verse, a verse to describe the the uh, the terrible nature of that sin of of not doing something when you had an opportunity to do it. You have despised the word of God, and that soul shall be utterly cut off from the source of life. Not literally, but at least in a, in a description to illustrate the severity of overlooking a mitzvah of the title. Pshita then, so then it's obvious that such a person, would be considered wicked even more so than one who de desecrated the, uh, the commands of the sages. Hang on a second now. So where's the Bainani? A, a righteous person is one who never sinned. A wicked person is a person who sinned even a little bit or even saw somebody else sin and didn't say anything. Where is there room for a Benini in here? Where the Benini must, from what we have learned so far, the Benini can be a, must be a person who never wastes even a moment of, of Torah study. And who in the world doesn't waste a moment from Torah study? Well, now that clears up why Rabbah could say about himself that he's a Benini, because he never wasted a moment of learning Torah, and we just now figured out that the Benini has to be a person who practically never wasted a minute from learning Torah. Special note from the Alter Rebbe, a little uh, analysis on one point here. 
When it says in Zoya that a person whose sins are few is called a righteous person. That means that you could be righteous even if you've sinned a little. That's not the, that is not a decision. That's not a decisive statement. That was a question asked by one sage to the prophet Eliyahu. Uh, but the decisive statement is, as we said earlier. So just for those who have studied that portion of Talmud and would be confused by the seeming contradiction, it's not a contradiction. That statement was asked as a question, not as a teaching or not as a point of law. Back to the question and answer. We just learned that the truly righteous person is one who's never sinned. Okay? And the person who sinned even a little... It's called a Russia. Then we concluded, since Rabba confused himself with a Russia, with a Bainani, Rabba said he's the intermediary level of Bainani. That means that the Bainani cannot even have ever sinned by transgressing or overlooking uh, even the smallest command or prohibition. That means the Bainani has no sinful behavior whatsoever. That seems to contradict a well-known saying. This well-known saying comes from, it, it's reflected in Rambam and in Gemara on Rosh Hashanah. It says that if a person is half mitzvahs and half averas, that means half virtuous behavior and half sinful behavior, that's called a benani. That's called this intermediate level of benani. But if he has, if he has majority of his behavior is virtuous, and only the minority of his behavior is sinful, that means he has some sins, but he's mostly doing the right thing. That's called a righteous person, a pious person. That contradicts what we said just before. Just before we said that the intermediate person cannot even have a single sin on his record. Certainly then the pious person, the righteous person should not have any sin on his record. We're back to the question, what is this? What is the Gemara here saying? How can you describe a Bainani as a person that's half sinful and half virtuous? Says the Alter Rebbe, the author of Tanya, he says, Hushema Mushal. That's borrowed language. Describing judgment, his reward and his punishment. Because the person will be judged after the majority of his behavior. So a person who's the majority of his behavior is, is righteous, he'll be called a righteous person in his judgment. Because he will be acquitted in his ultimate trial in the day of judgment. But if you really want to describe your station in life or the station of any person in their life truly and, and honestly and openly, the true definition of what is a tzaddik, a righteous person, and what is a bainani, an intermediate person, and what is a rasha, a wicked person, Amr Razal, the sages have told us, like we were learned earlier at tzaddikim, the truly righteous, they have only one voice in their heads. Yetzer toiv sheftan. They are judged by only one inclination, their good inclination. Where do we see that? They learned it from the verse that King David said about himself, my heart is empty inside me. What does it mean my heart is empty inside me? There is no opposing voice. It doesn't have an evil inclination. He killed it through fasting. That's the righteous person. Any Anybody any person who has not achieved that level, even though his merits outweigh his sinful behavior, he is not on the level of a real tzaddik. And that's why the sages said in the Medrash, Hashem saw righteous people, meaning truly righteous people. So he spread them out through all the generations because the world doesn't exist without tzaddikim. As it says, the righteous are the foundation of the world. Without the righteous, the world doesn't stand. So now this is the question. What does it mean that Hashem has determined that you will be righteous and you will be wicked? What does it mean that Hashem makes you swear that you will be righteous and you won't be wicked? What does it mean Hashem wants you to view yourself like a wicked person? What does it mean that there's such a thing as a Bainani, an intermediate person who has no sin, but is not a righteous person, is not in the category of tzaddik. To understand all of this, we have to understand all the details 
of the inner workings of the human soul and the world that we occupy spiritually and physically, meaning the inner workings of the spiritual parts of the world, the inner workings of the physical parts of the world, which are also spiritual. The inner workings are always spiritual. And that's what the Alter Rebbe will give us now for the next eight chapters. First, he'll describe to us ourselves. Then he will describe to us the playing field, the field of battle. The explanation is like this. According to what is explained in Kabbalah, that every single Jewish person, whether they be righteous, whether they be wicked, they have two souls. As it says in the verse, that verse opens with the word ruach in the singular, but then goes on to say souls in the plural implying that to each human spirit, there are two souls. Shehen shtei nefashes, meaning two life forces, nefesh achas mitzad klipa v'sitra achra, one life force from the klipa and sitra achra. Klipa means, we'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll borrow the term peel, husk of creation, meaning the dark, the concealment, the part that hides godliness. Sitra achra means the opposition, the opposition to godliness. And we have one soul that comes from that team, from the opposition team. What's the function of it? Why do we have it? Well, that's the soul in charge of the bodily function of the human being. As it says, that the soul of the flesh is in the blood. That is describing the soul that is from the husk, from the, from the created world. That's a very important soul. You can't live without it but it has some nasty side effects uh, because it everything in the world is made of four elements and the four elements have a spiritual counterpart that you have earth, water, air, wind, and fire. And from the unholy earth, water, wind, and fire of the bodily soul, we have some negative character traits, namely the Hainu, anger and arrogance from the element of fire whose nature is to rise upward. The appetite for pleasure from the element of water, because water is the source of all delightful things. It causes all delightful things to grow. So in the soul and spirit of the human being, we have that characteristic of water, of the yearning for something delightful, something pleasurable. Frivolity, scoffing, boasting, and idle talk, emptiness from the element of air, which lacks substance. Laziness and depression from the element of earth, whose nature is to stay in the same place and to fall downwards. However, it's true that there are some negative side effects, but the bodily soul of the Jew is unique in that it comes from a certain parv, a certain uh, finer husk, a certain finer element of the creation that allows some divine, some divinity, some of God's godly influence to shine through. And therefore we have some naturally good characteristics as well. Uh, there is also good character traits inher inherent in every Jew's character. Like for example, compassion and benevolence. Boys, they are natural to this Jewish bodily soul. Uh, for the Jewish people, that is a rule without exception. Uh, for the nations of the world, it's a big, big world, and some people have these uh, natural uh, traits and other people don't, but for the Jewish people, it has a rule. Uh, Torah decreed that it is a rule, and if a, a Jew doesn't have these character traits, you have to question their, 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 their uh, lineage. Compassion and benevolence. What exactly is the nature of the Jewish bodily soul? It's from a klipa, from a husk called noiga which allows some light to shine through, which has some good in it. This husk happens to be the, uh, a pretty good blend of good and evil, whereas the true husk of the world is almost utter darkness and no goodness shines through it at all. So because the mist, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge and everything became a mixture of good and evil, this is a great representation of the mixture of good and evil, where it's darkness, it conceals godliness, but it also allows some goodness to shine through. Whereas there are those among the nations of the world whose soul is from the utter unclean klippus, 
where no goodness shines through them at all. That there are among the nations people who do goodness and it's only for their own sake. As the Gemara explains further on the post of that kindness for those among the nations who have this kind of soul is a sin. That any charity or kindness or good deeds done by those those among the nations who have this purely uh, un, purely worldly bodily soul where no goodness shines through at all, the fact is that they can still be helpful and they can still be charitable, but it would be for ulterior motives. That's the first chapter. What have we learned? We have learned that we have a bodily soul who has some negative character traits. Uh, we would call this bodily soul self-preservation and the life of the body. However, that's not the end of the story. This is the second chapter. The second soul of the Jewish people, he, Chelek Elikami, Mal Mamish, is a veritable part of Hashem, literally. As described in the verse that Hashem blew the breath of life into the, nost- into the nostrils of Adam, we pray every day and we say, Hashem, you blew my soul into me. So it doesn't only apply to Adam, it applies to all of us. What does it mean that he blew? What's the significance? One who blows, blows from deep inside of him. From his innermost and deepest strength. That when a person is blowing a balloon, for example, and he's blowing hard, he is expelling his essential life force in there. And that's why, that's why when a person will blow from the depths, when a person is blowing hard, he can wipe himself out very quickly. But if he's blowing softly, he could blow for a long time. Or talking, he's expelling breath, but he could go on for a long time. There's another way to understand it. First of all, yeah, the Jewish soul is a piece of Hashem because it says Hashem blew the soul from the depths of himself whereas the rest of creation, he spoke into existence. It's a different level of expression. The world, all of the creation comes from an exterior level, just speaking, which could go on forever, and it doesn't really take all your energy, while the soul of the Jewish people comes from a deep blowing from a very deep place. And the the lesson is easily understood. There's another way to describe the fact that the Jewish people are a veritable, they have a soul that's a veritable piece of Hashem. So too, allegorically, the Jewish people have ascended in Hashem's thoughts. As it says in the verse, the Jewish people are my firstborn son. You are a son to Hashem, your God. Pirush, that means, what's the message of the language of son, being a child of Hashem? Just as the son comes from the DNA, the deepest matter of the, the deepest place of the father's physiology, so too, the soul of every Jew is derived from Hashem's deepest physiology, so to speak, in a manner of speaking. We're borrowing human terms to describe something about Hashem. What is that deepest physiological place? Wisdom, thought. Why? Because Hashem is wise, but not with wisdom that we know. When we say the Jewish people as the soul is a part of Hashem's wisdom or rose up in Hashem's thought, we're talking about a level. Hashem's thought is one with himself. Unlike a human being, unlike a human being who's, we have the vehicle, we have the tools for thinking, then we have the subject matter that we are thinking. And then aside from all that, there is us who is doing the thinking. Is three separate things. Hashem, he is the thinker, he is the ability to think, and he is the thought. That's something that we're not really able to grasp because it's not in our experience. But when we say the soul of a Jew rose in Hashem's thoughts, that means that the soul of the Jew begins in Hashem himself, in God himself. This is something that people cannot really understand properly. As it says in the verse, you can search for Hashem, but there's no. You can search for understanding of God, but there are some things you're not just going. You're just not going to find. And it also says, "The way I think is not the way you're going to think." There are some things that you're not going to grasp about Hashem. Hagoha, footnote. The Alter Rebbe points out that when we brought up this uh, teaching from Rambam, that God is the thinker, the thought, 
and the ability to think altogether, the Kabbalah agrees with him. Kabbalah does not always agree with Rambam. In this case, Kabbalah does agree with Rambam. The Gamlifi Kabbalah Sa'arizal, it's even Milsa, even according to the Arizal, uh, where it's unclear, but this seems to be the, the uh, consensus. This is so only when it applies to uh, how the light of Hashem, the infinite light of God, is invested in the vessels of the various spiritual levels, beginning in the vessels of Chabad of Atzilus. We'll get into that in later chapters. However, there is a place uh, where the light is not invested in creation, where this teaching of the Rambam would not apply. As explained elsewhere, that there is a there is a place in Hashem's process, in God's creative process, when even the highest of the levels that have emerged into into existence are considered very very lowly, and therefore it would be an, an insult to describe a lowly level as being God himself or one with God. Uh, okay, that's the end of the note. Now let's go back. We said every Jew has a, has a soul in them that's a veritable piece of God. And we said, how? Because Hashem blew it from the depths of himself. Or another analogy, we're described as children of God. And just as children are derived from the deepest physiological material, of the parent, so too the soul of the Jew is derived from the deepest physiological, so to speak, level of God. You might think, well, since there are so many gradations, variations of Jewish souls and Jewish spirits, level on top of level, higher and higher, lower and lower. Like, for example, if you were to compare the soul of the patriarchs, Avram, Yitzchok, and Yaakov, or Moshe Rabbeinu, all of Ashalem, to the souls of our generation, you would see that there's, uh, there doesn't seem to be much in common. They would be compared to heels. Our, the souls of our generation would be like the feet compared to the uh, in, incredible souls of the, the first generations of Jewish people. Similarly, in each generation, there are those among us who are particularly inspired people because their souls are really high and strong. And then there are the simple people among us whose souls seem to be very detached, very uninspired. Likewise, there's a similar distinction between different nefashis, different soul levels of nefesh. Because every soul consists of nefesh, ruach, and neshama. In other words, every soul has different levels, and different people will live and experience their lives on different, uh, expressing different portions of their own souls. So we see that there are different ranks, there are different levels, many, many on innumerable levels and innumerable gradations of soul. They say they're all going to come from the same place. The answer is yes, of course. The source of every single Jewish soul. From the highest level of the soul of Moses and Abraham until the lowest level of all the, the Jewish people that you look at them and you say, I don't see a spark of Jewishness in them. The souls of the lowest that are clothed in the in the uh, illiterate, which is a Talmudic way of saying a person that's not involved in Judaism. The Kal Shebekalim and those who are lightheaded Jews, which is the Talmud's way of saying people that are uh, are insensitive and callous towards Judaism, which are, is different than not having a connection. It's different than not having a, a, an active interest. Nimshach and it doesn't matter. No matter the soul, no matter the Jew, no matter the person, every soul comes from the Chachma Yilok of Yachl. Every soul comes from the mind, so to speak, of Hashem. In that manner all jewish souls are the same let's take the analogy you want to understand this let's take the analogy of the body of the baby that comes from all of it comes from the same uh, original material from the parent even the nails of the toenails 
The toenails are made from that same, very same material. Sure, there is a process where it's developed and it evolves in the womb of the mother, and it becomes coarsened and descends degree by degree. It went from essential, it changes from being essential DNA material to becoming something more simple like nails. The im kal zed, that doesn't change the fact that it is that its source, it's rooted in the incredible source from where it came from in the beginning, which is that original uh, essential physiological material of the father. That doesn't change just because the final expression of it is toenails. It still comes from the same, the very same place that the brain of the child comes from. Even now, while the child is alive and separated from his parents, meaning he's his own, he's his own person, the life force for the nails continues to flow through his mind, the baby's mind. Uh, and, that, and that is because life of the child flows through the mind. It comes from the father's mind, essence, through the child's mind, essence, and the whole life of, the, of this child is attached to the essence of its body, which is attached to the essence of the parent's body. This is described in the Gemara there, that every part of the body, even the simplest, the nails and the sinews, the bones, all come from the original DNA material of the parent. As explained in Kabbalah, that that the garments that the that Adam and Eve were wearing uh, before they made their own clothing were of nails. Where do those nails come from? Those nails come from the cognitive faculty of the brain. There too, you see that the lowest level, the most why are we why are we using the example of nails? Nails is something that you constantly cut off of your body. There's no life in them. It seems. If, you're, if you pull a nail, it hurts because there's life in your finger, not because there's life in your nail. So you could say, well, the nail must be really cut off from the source of life. No, even the nail is rooted in the original source of life, same as the brain, same as everything. So too, among the Jewish people. That, no matter how the final expression of that soul is, by the soul's descending degree after degree through the unfolding of creation, the various levels of creation, beginning with Atsilos, the highest, the highest level of creation, Bria, the second highest, Yitzira, the third, and Asiya, the fourth, it all comes, it all comes from the wisdom of Hashem. As it says, everything comes from Chachma, from the mind of Hashem. It's because of that descent through all the levels that the soul becomes morphed, changed, clothed, and, and, uh, and transformed into the kind of soul that could enter the body of a very simple, a very simple and even callous person. The im kolze, and nevertheless, it doesn't change the fact that that every soul of every Jew remains bound, united in a complete and wonderful unity with their original source, which is an extension of Hashem's supernal wisdom. Because remember we said in the, in the body of the child, the fingernails are living by the influence that flows through the brain of the child. So too in every generation, those among us whose souls are dimmed and stiff and muted, we receive our spiritual sustenance through the soul's that we would consider the heads of our generation, the most inspired, the most on fire. And those are called the tzaddikim, the righteous men of our generation, the chachamim and the Torah scholars of our generation, Rashi b'nei Yisrael, Shebedirim, the heads of the Jewish people in each generation. And through them, we're attached to the original source. Through them, we are attached to the original source, which is Hashem's own wisdom, Hashem's own thought. So even though we are now living our own lives and we are already we have already emerged into creation and we are who we are there is no jew alive at any point 
whose soul is utterly and completely cut off from Hashem, even though he may seem to be without any connection, without any attachment to Judaism. But it never is that way. There is always a link. And that link for most people comes through the powerful souls that, are, that occupy the bodies of the scholars and the sages and the heads of each generation. Now that ever takes a little detour to explain something related. Now we can understand the statement from the sages where they explained the verse, Ule Dovka Boy, the command to cleave to Hashem, to cleave to God, that one who cleaves to a Torah scholar, it's as if he is, it's as if he is cleaving to God Himself. Because through cleaving to the Torah scholars, if we will attach ourselves to the heads of our generation, we who could com- we would consider ourselves the appendages, the, the lower souls, if we're going to attach ourselves through service and love and respect and reverence to the sages and the scholars and the leaders of our generation, we could attach our souls to them. And they are attached to the original source because their hearts and souls are open completely to God. And in this way, we are in fact cleaving to God himself directly through those tzaddikim. Um, they are attached to Hashem himself because they're attached to his wisdom and he and his wisdom are one, as we said from the Rambam. But the, other, the opposite is also true. Those who rebel against the sages and the scholars and the leaders of the Jewish of the Jewish people in each generation, that means that they will still receive their life force from these sages and from these leaders, but it will be in a diminished and in a in a uh, undesired manner, and we'll talk about that also in the coming chapters. Now the question is: Wait a minute. You're saying that there are many gradations of souls and that the souls enter the world on a certain level. Some souls are meant for great tzaddikim and righteous people and scholars and some souls are meant for simpletons and uh, and worldly people and business people and even callous people. But that seems to contradict what we learned in the Zohar that the quality of the spiritual life of a person, yeah, the person's spiritual sensitivity is dependent on the parent's intentions during their intimacy, when they're conceiving this child. Which is not the case with the children of ignorant, the ignorant people who do not conduct themselves properly during the work of conceiving a child. Says the Rebbe, it's not a contradiction. There is the soul, and then there is the garment of the soul. The soul itself, the spirit of God, will enter the will enter the person, but it has to be clothed in a in a vehicle that can interact with the person himself. That vehicle is provided. That garment, that vessel, to contain the spark of God, uh, has to come from the parents. Every soul has a garment that comes from the parents, that comes from the parents' soul. All the good deeds that a person does, it all is, is performed through that vehicle, through that vessel that comes from the parents. Even the sustenance that heaven gives to the person is also through that vehicle that he gets from the parents, that vessel for the soul. So then if the parents will, will purify themselves and sanctify themselves while they're during the work of conceiving a child, they will succeed in bringing down a holy garment for, and a fine garment, and a, a garment that reflects godliness for their child. And it won't help that the person that God granted this child a, a, a powerful spiritual soul. The parents have to sanctify themselves during the work of conceiving the child in order that the garment not stymie, not mute the power of that soul. But as for the soul itself, as distinct from its garment, is not affected by the parent's behavior during conception. It happens sometimes that 
that a really powerful spiritual soul will enter the body of a really lowly person. All of this has been explained in various places in Kabbalah. That is the divine soul. What have we said so far? We asked the question, what is this Benini? And the Rebbe said, you want to understand that? First, you have to understand what we're dealing with. Every Jew has two souls. One soul is self-oriented. It's the bodily soul. Then you have another soul that is a veritable piece of God. It is literally a piece of God, and every Jew has it. Let's learn more about that soul. Chapter 3. It doesn't matter what level of soul you have. Every level of every soul has 10 soul powers, 10 faculties. Why 10? Because we're created in the image of God. And God's creative process has 10 powers. Those 10 powers, which are called 10 sephiris, they are divided into two groups, basically. Shehein, Shalish, Imais, Veshevak, Fulais. In the powers of God that God emanated, God created powers with which he manages his creation. There are three primary powers and there are seven secondary powers. What are the three primary and what are the seven secondary? Pirush, that means Chochma, Bina, Das, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Those are the primaries called mothers. And the secondary ones are Shiva, Simehabinyan, the seven days of the week are chesed, kindness, gvura, might, tiferes, beauty, and so on. All the seven of them, and we'll go through them. Uh, we went through them uh, with my father in one of the introductory courses, which we will post on our YouTube channel. So too, because we are created in the image of God, and God has those 10 powers divided up into two general categories. Human beings also have 10 powers divided into two categories, intellect and emotions. The intellect also, like Hashem, it includes three parts, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and the emotions of a person. We're talking about the divine soul's emotions. The divine soul's emotions are to love Hashem, to fear Hashem, to revere Hashem, to beautify Hashem, and so on. Notice the soul's emotions are all about God. Everything of the godly soul is about God. The Chabad Nikru Imis, in both instances, both in the case of the divine powers and the soul powers, they're both called, the intellectual powers are called the primaries or the mothers uh, because they are the source, Makir Limides, for the emotions. They are the source for the emotions, Ki Hamides Him Tildes Chabad, because emotions are the product of a person's intellect. Ubi Inyan, let's understand that now for a minute because the intellectual faculty of the rational soul, the rational soul means the, the intellectual qualities within the soul. That's a person's ability to conceive any subject, to understand any subject. The, the ability to perceive something, to come up with a new idea is called the potential of what is. That's interesting. Why does the pursuit of knowledge begin with the ability of what is it starts with a discovery the discovery begins with the ability to ask what is what's going on what don't i know then the work of taking that discovery and and developing it into a full on subject a full on lecture to get the full picture that's called analysis and that happens uh, let's read the, uh, the Rebbe's words so we're not skipping anything. When you actualize that discovery, that intellectual discovery, which means, that means you contemplate in your mind, to understand the subject matter correctly, and deeply, meaning you're discovering every detail, every aspect, every facet, as it evolves from the concept which you have discovered in your intellect, that process of discovering, that process of analysis, that's called Bina. So far we have two. Chachma is the ability to say, tell me something I don't know. To discover something new. Bina is the ability to analyze that new idea and really flesh it out and see it for what it really is truly. Chachma and Bina, those two. Hein, heim, av, Hashem, 
those in the divine soul, those are the causes which bring about a person's love for God and fear of God and reverence for God. Because it's the intellect of the soul when a person is delving deeply into matters about Hashem's greatness, how God fills all space, but really at the same time, He transcends all space, all things, and how everything that we deem so impressive, big, and beautiful is really compared to Hashem is, is as not. This will inspire a person to be truly moved to revere and to be impressed with the greatness of Hashem uh, in his mind and in his thoughts. To fear, revere, and hopefully to be ashamed in Hashem's presence, meaning the way you would be uh, intimidated, so to speak, not in a bad way, but in the best way. Uh, to be intimidated in the presence of somebody that you adore and you revere and you consider very, very much greater than you uh, because Hashem's greatness really truly is. Hashem's greatness has no limit, it has no end. And that will bring about also, you see, knowledge, awareness of Hashem's greatness, deep thoughts about Hashem's greatness that take place in the mind and in the thought through discovery and analysis and discovery and analysis, repeating that process until you really have a good grasp of just how great Hashem might be not only will it lead you to the conclusion that you must revere Hashem and that you must fear Hashem, but it may actually lead to a real true feeling of fear of Hashem in your heart. When that happens, you will also love Hashem. Loving Hashem meaning, you will learn, yearn, and desire, and long for a connection to Hashem. To the greatness of Hashem, that's called the yearning of the soul, the consumption of the soul. As King David writes, the psalmist, whoever it was, says, my soul longs for you, and indeed it is consumed. It's consumed by the yearning to be close to Hashem. And it says also another verse, my soul thirsts for God a yearning, a tremendous yearning, and it also says, my soul thirsts for you. This expression is a, a description. These expressions of thirsting, yearning, being consumed with, fainting from, this, this uh, love for Hashem is a description of the yearning and the thirst that the soul experiences when a person realizes the greatness of Hashem by studying it. That's him, this loving thirst for Hashem is derived from Yisrael Eishem and Afshali Kis, from the element of fire in the godly soul. Remember, we described the elements in the animal soul, in the bodily soul. Now we're describing some of the elements from the godly soul. The element of fire in the divine soul is the source of the incredible, overwhelming, all-consuming, passionate yearning for God for a connection to Hashem that the godly soul experiences. <speaking in Hebrew> The students of natural sciences, as well as Kabbalah, agree on this point, that the element of fire is housed in the heart. Whereas the source of the element of water and moisture is in the brain. What is the element of water in the godly soul? That is the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge of the, God, of the divine soul are the product of the element of water, because the moisture and the uh, and the The water, I don't know what it's called, the uh, moisture um, is in the brain. Flowing, flowing, affluent. Um, why water? Why moisture? Because true delight, the highest delight, and water is reflected in delight and pleasure, is intellectual for a human being. Intellect is the greatest delight. And secondly, water is cold as opposed to passionate. Dispassionate. And the mind is dispassionate while the heart is passionate. That's Chachma and Bina. We learned in depth now, the author Rebbe described in detail Chachma, the discovery process, Bina and the analysis process, and how the two of them together give birth to all kinds of positive emotions. Bushar Hamidas Kulam, all the other emotions meaning we have described the development of reverence for Hashem 
and we've described the process or the development of love for Hashem, all the other uh, soul powers are offshoots and derivatives from this fear and this love, and they are derivatives of them. All this is explained elsewhere. The hadas, the third intellectual attribute, the third intellectual attribute, is chachma bina and das. What's das? Das might even be the most important, but that comes also later in Tanya. The author will devote several chapters to that. Adam yoda es chava. The Torah tells us man knew chava. So what's das? Knowing knowledge. Ulashin discussions with chavras that implies connection and attachment. What's attachment in terms of an intellectual project is to attach your mind strongly to a subject and to and to delve to fix your mind firmly on that on that study, uh, and you don't let it go and you don't avert your attention from it. And when we're talking about the divine soul, the subject matter is inevitably going to be Torah, mitzvahs, and the greatness of God. Okay, uh, let's read the Alter Rebbe's words. You attach your mind deeply and strongly. You affix your thoughts firmly in the greatness of the infinite one, Hashem. Without removing or being distracted at all. Because even a person who has studied a lot about the greatness of Hashem, if he will not regularly and deeply and consistently attach his thoughts for uh, f- to that subject matter, his knowledge, his awareness of the greatness of Hashem is not going to be enough to bring about true emotions of love and reverence, only momentary, mm, imaginary, temporary uh, inspirations, sparks of inspiration of love and reverence that don't stay with you and don't have any real effect on your behavior. And then, and that's why, as far as we're concerned, they're not real. The Alkane, and therefore, Hadas, this third intellectual piece. We had Chochma, which is the discovery process. We had Bina, which is the analysis process. And now we have Das, that is the attachment process. Attaching yourself to the subject that you're studying that das who kiyum hamidas v'chayusan is really the real mother is real is really the power of is this is the staying power of any emotion. That's the power that sustains the emotions. V'hu kailel chesed u'gvura. This das it comprises chesed and gvura. That means pirish av of anafel the year of anafel. Not only chesed and gvura, but chesed and everything that that means it doesn't only. Uh, in, it doesn't only contain in it the ability to love, but it contains in it the ability to love and everything associated with love, to be devoted, to sacrifice. And it contains in it also fear of Hashem and everything associated with fear of Hashem. To be stubborn, to be, uh, what's the other word? Uh, persistent these are the ten soul powers in the divine soul in the godly soul in addition to ten soul powers there are also three garments three vehicles of expression I guess we'll have to jump into those God willing next week at 11 a.m. And because of the nature of the project that we are in middle of, we are going to start immediately at 11 a.m. And um, I will post these recordings on our YouTube channel for review. And I thank you each for joining us this morning and taking some time out of your day to learn the Holy Tanya.